Introducing YouTube memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. November 6, 1966. The Philadelphia Eagles pull off what can only be described as a stunning upset, and quite possibly, the biggest upset in franchise history. No one was giving them a chance in the world to beat the Dallas Cowboys, a team that entered the game with a 5-1-1 record, especially after what happened the last time these teams met, which we'll get to later. The Cowboys were 15-point favorites, the Eagles had lost three of their last five games, and looked like they had no shot in the world to beat what many people consider to be the best team in all of football, and a near-unstoppable juggernaut that was not only averaging 38 points per game midway through the year, but had scored 47 or more in more than half of those games, eclipsing the 50-point mark three times. Yet the Philadelphia Eagles, against all odds, found a way, and somehow won the game by a final score of 24-23. Despite the fact that they only had five first downs for the entire game. Despite the fact that they lost the turnover battle. Despite the fact that they had 80 yards of offense on the day. And despite the fact that they went into the halftime break with the lead. Despite having just one first down. Seriously. One first down in the entire first half of action. With zero touchdowns scored throughout the entire contest while they were on offense. And they were winning the game. It was remarkable. It was one of those games that was insanely bizarre, and nearly 60 years later, it's still somewhat of a mystery as to how exactly the Eagles won this one. I made a video about that game over three years ago, so you can learn more about the bizarre nature of that contest by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And part of what made that upset so special was the fact that the two teams played each other earlier in the season. And that game... Well, that game did not go like that. Not even close. If there was an NFL equivalent of Team USA defeating the Soviet Union in the Winter Olympics just a month after they got destroyed by them in the exhibition game, this is the one. Because the first meeting between these teams was nothing short of a bloodbath. Just how bad was it? Well, it was so bad that it led to the Eagles genuinely believing when they landed back in Philadelphia that their fans were going to kill them. And I don't mean torn apart in the media, or booed, or heavily criticized, or whatnot. I mean literally kill them. Whether this fear was warranted, well, you be the judge of that. But among the crazy fan controversies involving the Philadelphia Eagles in their long history, of which there are many, this is one of the more unique ones that you probably don't know about. But with the Eagles and Cowboys playing each other this week if you're watching at the time of this video, deserves a deep dive today. Because this is the story behind one of the most bizarre fan controversies in the over 90 year history of the Philadelphia Eagles franchise. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand how the game itself went that led the fans to be as unruly as you might imagine to the point where the thumbnail that got you to click on this video was even a possibility in the first place. It's October 9th, 1966. It's week 5 of the NFL season, and we've got an absolutely big game on our hands in the East between the Dallas Cowboys and the Philadelphia Eagles. For the Eagles, even though it is week 5, it is not an exaggeration to say that this scheme against the rivals might truly be their entire season. Through four games, the Eagles sat at 2-2, two two, boasting a negative point differential and coming off of an embarrassing home loss to the St. Louis Cardinals, where they lost 41-10 after turning it over a whopping 5 times. Losing by 31 points, so losing by 5 possessions in the day and age when the 2 boy conversion did not exist, although it did exist in the AFL, is never fun. So they're looking for a bounce back game here against the Cowboys in a big way. And if they don't get it, the season is dead in the water. Remember that back in 1966? You had to finish first in your conference to make the playoffs and have a shot at the Super Bowl. If you weren't first, 
for all intents and purposes, you were last. And if you lost this game to drop to 2-3, and three, it would take a complete miracle to make the playoffs. Or even winning out the rest of the way and ending the year 11-3 and three might not be enough. You truly have no room for error if you lose this game. So there was a lot riding on this one. Especially since the team ahead of them in the standings was the Dallas Cowboys. Who were undefeated with a perfect 3-0 record. Who had dominated every opponent in their way. And who was only a few weeks removed from what head coach Tom Landry called a perfect game in their 52-7 drubbing against the New York Giants, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. This game was not going to be easy. The Cowboys were favored by more than two touchdowns, but for the Eagles, they were hoping to win and put up a fight. They absolutely had to. And holy cow, that did not happen. Not in the slightest bit. Because if ever the phrase ugly with a capital you apply to a singular game of football, this was it. Because man, this game truly was ugly with a capital U, as you can probably tell from all these lowlights. By the time the final whistle sounded, the Cowboys emerged victorious by a final score of 56-7, taking it by 49 points or 7 touchdowns. Dallas was always in control of this game, leading it 21-0 at the end of the first quarter with three drives and three touchdowns, while the Eagles had three drives resulting in three punts. Leading 49-0 midway through the fourth quarter, and not allowing a touchdown until late in the fourth quarter, when the backups were in. This truly looked like one of those games between an FCF school and a top 10 program. Because these teams did not belong on the same field at all. The Cowboys nearly tripled the Eagles in first downs, winning that battle 32-11. The Cowboys triple the Eagles in total yardage, winning that battle 652 to 217. Yes, 652 yards of offense. The Cowboys ran 71 plays on the day, so if you do the math, that is an astonishing 9.2 yards per play. And they were not even trying in the second half on offense because the backups were in and they were just trying to run out the clock. Basically, the Cowboys were averaging a first down per play. The Cowboys had roughly two and a half times the passing yards that the Eagles did, winning that battle 447 to 187, and they had about five times the rushing yards that the Eagles did, winning that battle 212 to 38. While the Eagles averaged barely two yards per carry, the Cowboys averaged over 6.6, which is obviously an absurdly high total. And Cowboys starting quarterback Don Meredith had the best scheme of his career as he ended the day going 19 for 26 with 394 yards, 5 touchdowns, no interceptions, and a passer rating of 154.6, not even 4 points shy of the perfect 158.3 rating. I don't know how you can complete 73% of your passes, not turn it over, throw 5 touchdowns, and throw for just under 400 yards, and not have a perfect passer rating. But I digress. The formula is a bit weird. The game was so bad, that Cowboys head coach Tom Landry hated the fact that his team won by that many points afterwards, even though the backups and the third stringers were in, and had been in for basically the entire second half. And it was so bad, that the fans applauded when the Eagles scored a touchdown. Even though the game was in Dallas, they just felt bad for them. It was quite possibly the most dominant performance in the history of the Dallas Cowboys, and that is saying something. And on the flip side, it was quite possibly the ugliest performance in the history of the Philadelphia Eagles, which is also saying something. And you can bet your bottom dollar that Eagle fans were not happy about this performance at all. Oh man, were they not happy. Because what happens after a team plays a game on the road and the game is far away, so it's not within driving distance? Well, they have to return to their home city. And they usually do that by playing, especially if it's something like Dallas to Philadelphia, which would just not be feasible or quick through any other mode of transportation. Now the fans know this, and it always seems to be a bit of a ritual to greet the team whenever they get back, win or lose. I've talked many times on this channel about times where fans greeted the team after a game, with incredibly mixed results to say the least. You can learn more about one of those bizarre incidents where it turned out to be a complete disaster and a near riot broke out in Seattle 
by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The idea is that you show your support to the team, win or lose. And obviously, the mood is way more festive after a win than after a loss. But for this game in Dallas, this game that you've been watching this whole time, where the Eagles lost 56 to seven, laid an egg, and basically had their entire season end right in front of their very eyes, one of two things was going to happen. Either no fans were going to show up and greet the team at the airport, which I can't exactly blame the fans for after a 49 point loss like that where they just didn't show up, or the fans were going to come and were going to be out for blood. And I truly mean out for blood. Because after the game, Jerry Woolman, the owner of the Eagles, feared the absolute worst. He knew his fan base and he feared the worst. Because after the game, knowing that the Eagles had fans that came to the airport to greet the team, he immediately called up Philadelphia International Airport and basically said, this is a code red situation. The demand by Woolen was executed, and for the time period, was crazy. Anyone who comes to the airport and says they're here to greet the team on their return from Dallas, you are to conduct high-level security on. Frisk them. Frisk them thoroughly. Frisk them from head to toe. Make sure they do not have any guns on them. Make sure they don't have any firearms. Do not let them in the building unless otherwise. I can't even think of a good equivalent for the time, but I know people that have gone to presidential debates before, and there are so many security checkpoints from what I've heard that you wouldn't believe it. You are to do that. You are to frisk and conduct heavy security on anyone who says they are here to greet the Eagles. Check everything, because after that game, I wouldn't put it past our fans to literally try to kill us. Now you might be saying, wait a second, what's the big deal? That's just airport security. And in 2023, you're 100% right. In 2023, or whenever you're watching this video, with airport security the way that it is, this is not a big deal. You're going to go through metal detectors and whatnot and be checked to make sure that you don't have a firearm on you at the airport. But in 1966, this was unheard of. Because airport security in 1966 was the same as the Eagles defense during this game against the Cowboys. Completely non-existent. There was no security at all. You could just walk through airports as though they were shopping malls. And you didn't even need a ticket to get to the gate. It wasn't until 1973 that people started getting screened. So in 1966, airports were like any other establishment. If anything, they were more lax than other establishments. How bad was airport security in 1966? Or rather, how non-existent was it? Here are just some of the weird and wacky stories from 1966 alone about how loose airports were. The airports were under such little security that in February alone, there were multiple incidents of cows just rolling onto the runway and causing six figures worth of damage to the plane. At an airport in Seattle, a pony was somehow able to run onto the runway, because that was a thing. Thievery was incredibly commonplace, because you could just walk into an airport without a ticket, steal some jewelry, and leave, with insurance companies saying that thievery was worse at airports than it was at docks, and that they don't even screen their employees to check if they have a criminal record or whatnot. And one writer wrote that airport security was non-essential and was something that could be done by retired police officers, much like school crossing guards. Seriously, how we viewed airport security was how we view the crossing guard that makes sure the cars stop and allow his kids to cross the street to get to school. And he wasn't the only one. Chief Gerald E. Ware, who ran security for an airport in Florida, and I use the term ran security very loosely, felt that all you needed was one man in a patrol car. Seriously, one man in a patrol car was sufficient security for an entire airport. That was what the world was like in 1966. It feels surreal 
and it feels like a completely different world that is unimaginable for anyone who didn't live through it and grew up in the 21st century. But that's what it was like. Seriously, one man in a patrol car? I've had more security guards than a food lion. So for the Eagles owners to come straight out and say, yeah, I need you to treat the arrival of this team like it's the President of the United States because our fans are out for blood is absolutely insane when you put it in that context. It's almost like if today, a team was flying back and the owner calls the airport to say, anyone who wants to greet the team, I need them to take off their clothes because I'm taking no chances. All their clothes. Maybe in 60 years, we'll have to take our clothes off before going through security. And that won't seem outlandish to anyone hearing that statement in 60 years' time. But today, in 2023, you'd look at the R like they had five heads. And that's what this entire situation was like. That's how ruthless some Eagle fans are, and that's how bad this game was. And the hysterical part about all of this after the game between these two teams behind me right here is the fact that the frisking and the intensive security was only for the people who were greeting the Eagles. It wasn't for anyone else in the airport, and the Eagles easily could have avoided this mess in the first place if they just landed on the runway and then took a bad exit out. The people at Philadelphia International Airport weren't worried about the possibility of someone potentially hijacking the plane or causing chaos in the air. They were more concerned with Eagles fans being so upset and so angry after the loss that they would try and kill their own team. If ever there was a case of a video being a time capsule, where it's something along the lines of, wow, this really feels weird, and the world was different back then in so many ways, this is the video right here. This is the one, folks. This is the one. For what it's worth, because of the tighter security, no eagle was harmed when they landed back in Philadelphia from this bloodbath of a game. So the eagles had as many players return home that night as they had to start the flight, which is good. And the Eagles, even though their season was pretty much dead in the water, would rebound from this game, would finish a respectable 9-5, and five, and as mentioned before, would win the second game against the Cowboys in a stunning upset that still lives on more than 60 years later. The fans didn't want to kill them after that game. But how bad was the first game that you've been watching this whole time? Well... While the Cowboys were full guns blazing on offense, the Eagles were worrying that their fans would literally be full guns blazing. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9pm Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.